Well, welcome everybody to the Friday seminar. And it is my great pleasure to welcome a collaborator and faculty affiliate, Dr. Hemed Tazoush, and also my own master supervisor from the University of Waterloo. So I have known him for many years. He was a mentor to me, both an undergraduate uh, doing research projects. He, he uh, took my first data structures and algorithm course, which is a very fundamental course for engineers and computer scientists with him. And uh, I've learned a lot from him, both uh, academically and, and professionally. So he was born after the Iranian Cultural Revolution and has uh, a, quite a story of moving from Iran to Germany. I still remember talking about that with him and hearing about his experiences. And I, I really benefited a lot from learning about not, you know, not just learning things technically from him, but uh, learning about uh, his, his struggles and his path to arriving in Canada. And um, another really interesting thing about him that's not always in the, in the biography is he, he's been involved in, with a number of industrial initiatives, uh, including starting a company, Sagastis, back in 2007. Uh, and that was uh, built in the Mars building, which uh, Vector shares. And uh, so it, it's really interesting having someone who has been prolific in academics, but also uh, entrepreneurial uh, initiatives. And so he's someone that uh, does have rich experience, the, the, the ups and downs of being an entrepreneur and a good person to, to consult with. And so Dr. Tazush has made a number of contributions in AI uh, and medical imaging. And most recently he's been working in the field of digital histopathology. And so he's going to talk to us uh, today about the work that he's doing. We're very lucky to also have a collaboration between our lab and his through the Ontario uh, Research Excellent Research, um, no, the Ontario Research Fund Re Research Excellent or ORFRE program. So without further ado, uh, welcome Dr. Tazouj and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to share with us today. Thank you very much, Graham, for the kind introduction. So uh, now you make my job very difficult to, <laughs> to satisfy those expectations that you created. Thank you. You are being kind. Um, yeah, so today we want to look at computational pathology and from AI perspective at a high level, talking about supervised versus unsupervised learning as far as it's concerning computational pathology, which is a very um, significant subfield in, in medicine. Uh, so Kimia Lab at the University of Waterloo has, uh, has some 12 PhD students, uh, two, three master's students, three uh, visiting scholars, a pathologist, a postdoc, an administrative assistant. We just happen to grow into a computational pathology lab founded in 2013. So, and it has been our entire focus to look at uh, applications of computer vision and AI in histopathology. As Graham mentioned, we have an ORF uh, uh, consortium. Uh, we work with uh, several colleagues, Dr. Crowley, Dr. Wutzi, Rahnamayan, and Graham himself. Um, we are working with multiple hospitals to make sure that uh, from the pathology side, we have the backup that we need, Dr. Patton, from Grand River, Dr. Campbell from McMaster, Dr. Diamond is from UHN, and Dr. Pantanovitz and Parwani from US, who are uh, who belong to um, pioneers of digital pathology. So uh, we, I, I want to give you just a brief overview of what you're talking about here. Basically, is microscope versus computer, and that's a tough uh, fight uh, because microscopes are very old. Um, the roots of microscopy goes back to 700 BC when we had the so-called Nimrod lens, piece of glasses that you could magnify stuff with. And then up to a thousand years ago with a book of optics, the basic, uh, the, the primitive principles of optics. Up to 400 years ago that we actually got microscopes and started using the word microscopes up to recent days that we have multiple uh, Nobel Prizes directly and indirectly related to microscopy. So when we talk about pathology, everything starts with biopsy. So we go to family physician or radiologist, doctors see something, they don't know what that is, we are sent to biopsy. There are different types of biopsy here, just two of them visualize the punch biopsy and the needle biopsy, which is basically we put 
some sort of needle or device in the human body. So it's an invasive procedure. And we take a piece of flesh uh, for out because we want to see what that is. Is it, is it inflammation? Is it cancer? Is it infection? What is it? Uh, and so what happens with the tissue sample is quite a huge thing. That's laboratory medicine, a, a gigantic part of medicine. So we fix the tissue, we process the tissue, we embed the tissue, we cut the tissue, we stain the tissue, and then we put it on a glass slide. That's a huge undertaking. Many, many experts in the lab are, are uh, involved with that. I'm just uh, skipping the details. Laboratory medicine, again, is a crucial part of uh, diagnosis of many, many diseases. Then you get to the final glass slide that you see on the left, which is a one by three inch here in this case, and uh, that piece of flesh, the pink stuff, after all that processing is on the glass slide, is a very thin uh, cut, such that you can put it under a light microscope, and the light goes through, and you can look through the lenses, and you can see stuff at specific magnification, and there you go. Yeah, we can do uh, actual diagnosis. So the modern pathology starts at the hospital. The patient goes, is referred to the hospital. We do the biopsy, and then we go to the lab, and we do, the, we do what I just described briefly, that we fix the tissue and put it on a glass light, and then we distribute it to uh, pathologists, and they look at it at the glass light under the microscope, and then they write a report, and they basically archive the glass slides. And then usually they have also the, the, the block with um, the entire biopsy sample that may be necessary at a later date. But that glass slide is basically everything. And we keep also those glass slides for many, many years, millions of them. So, and those are archived. And of course that costs and takes a lot of space because you have to keep them. Maybe the patient comes back, maybe for research we need them, maybe for epidemiology. Uh, considerations, we need them. And also we need them if there is a doubt and we send those glass slides to other hospitals, to other experts, and we do telepathology, we do diagnostic consultation, we do collaborative research, we all that, the glass slides are everything. So that glass slides, usually, as I said, you put it under the microscope and then the pathologist most likely with some specialty look at that and then comes up with a diagnosis. What, what is it? Is it? Is it carcinoma? Is it lymphoma? Is it inflammation? Is it benign? So and this is, the, this is the end of line. So if a family physician makes a mistake, we pick it up by the radiologist. If a radiology makes, make a mistake, we pick it up by the pathologist. If the pathologist makes a mistake, there is nobody to check that. Pathology is end of the line. So this is the ultimate diagnosis and as such, of course, very important. Now, the digital pathology is that you put those glass slides in a machine, in a scanner, you digitize, you basically put the microscope inside that gray box, and then you capture a high resolution image, you display it on the monitor, and then the pathologist can look at the monitor instead of looking through a microscope. Sounds trivial, is not. So since almost 20 years, people are struggling to get digital pathology uh, uh, except that more than 90% of hospitals are still using microscopes, only less than 10% are using digital. In Canada, it's worse than that, actually. Probably more than 96, 97% are still using microscopes. In Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries are approaching 50%, so they are the most advanced in using digital technology. And uh, one of the blessings of COVID now everybody is pushing for adoption of digital pathology, which is good for us in computer vision and um, AI. So there are many scanners. And so if you want to go digital, you will replace the microscope with one of these boxes. Basically, the microscope is inside. And the, the, the trouble is the pathologist does not see the microscope anymore. And you put the glass lights on those trays that you see on the right hand side different sizes, one by three, two by three, six by eight inches. And then you put it, insert it into the machine and the machine basically scan it like any other scanner. And then you have a digital image. So we call them whole slide images or WSIs. Whole slide images are gigantic gigapixel images, much bigger than 50,000 by 50,000 pixels. So, and every patient comes with many of them. So easily you get 10 gigabyte of data per patient. 
per case. So that's a huge, uh, um, a large mass of data that has to be processed. So this whole slide images or WSIs, which are digitized tissue samples, biopsy samples. So processing them in computer vision and using AI has many, many challenges. First of all, they are high resolution. If you look at that, they are stored in magnification level. And if you just go and in, uh, look at a specific part and look at the high magnification, you see this, you can zoom in and go up to see the cell nuclei and cell membrane and many, many more details. Uh, you can go from one X to two and a half X, five X, 10 X, 20 X, 40 X, 100 X. Uh, um, uh, and to look at the details, anatomic details of tissue. So, but the problem is one of the problem for us in AI is that there is no label data. So the labeling pathology data is very, very difficult because these images are big. Uh, digital technology is new compared to radiology. So we don't have much label data. So that's, that's a big headache for us. And of course, these images are huge. If I just look at that uh, sample patch that you see on the right, that simple, that small patch is already 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. So this image is close to 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. You cannot just insert this to a GPU. You cannot process this easily. You cannot even load it into the memory at once. You have to use a lot of tricks to do that. So. Uh, working with patches and tiles and sub-images instead of the entire image adds to the challenges of AI to understand the tissue sample in its entirety. Then the major challenge comes from that from computer science perspective is absolutely amazing and great for the new next generation of young scientists is that we have basically an infinite number of um, uh, patterns. I remember two, three years ago, when we started ORF, I had some discussions with Graham and we talked about this pattern diversity and pleomorphism, that the same thing, the same type of disease may have different shapes and different textures. And that creates a prohibitively large source space. That's basically an NP complete problem. You cannot use this by exhaustive search. You have to have some uh, uh, techniques to be able to cope with this data. The, the bigger problem uh, is also is a dilemma of feature extraction. So if I look at this skin sample and is a, is a 2.4 gigabyte file. So it's a three pieces of tissue at high magnification. So usually if you just get one patch, which is usually around thousand by thousand pixel and we extract some features. So if, if I look at those 1000, let's say 1024 features, typically at 32 bits, that's four kilobyte. So I have for this image, 4,500 patches roughly. That roughly, that's 180 megabyte, just features. So the image itself is 2.4 gigabyte. You may say as a computer scientist, who cares? Also save the 180 megabyte features. No, we can't. Because one of the challenges of going digital is the high cost for memory, for storage. And you need high performance storage. You cannot just go with HDD, you need SSD high performance storage. So we cannot save 180 megabyte of features with each, each tissue sample. We have to come up with other stuff, with dimensionality reduction, end-to-end -end hashing, something. So as, as to the problems. There is a lot, a lot of recent success for digital pathology. For example, uh, FDA cleared some three, four years ago, the first system to be approved for clinical use, the Philips system, and then recently also got approved for uh, approval of FDA clearance for uh, software, for example, for sacral pathology module to be used. So this was huge. This was very important for the pathology community that now uh, digital scanners and soft, uh, software can be used for clinical purposes, not just for research. The digital health, of course, picking up, you look at major hospitals like John Hopkins and Mayo Clinic, they are going digital, they are supporting going digital. So it's a good time for digital pathology, especially after the pandemic or during the pandemic because of pandemic. Last year, major things happened for the first time in the history. CMS allowed pathologists in the US to work remotely, to work from home, to, to diagnose cancer from home. This has never been done before. It was a first. It's one of the blessings of uh, COVID-19 and pandemic. So it is 
it is something that we cannot go back after the pandemic and say, oh, okay, now the pandemic is done. You have to come back to the hospital. Okay, maybe, uh, maybe I do some of the diagnosis from home as a pathologist. So that was a, that was a huge success, basically. So now from our perspective in the AI community, so when we talk about artificial learning or learning in artificial intelligence, we have, of course, supervised, maybe weekly supervised, unsupervised, self-supervised, I'm hearing, and I'm sure you will come up with some other labels for uh, learning. So with respect to any mixture between supervised and unsupervised. So, and the question is which one of them will, will, will use to, to address the challenges in digital pathology, you would say, yeah, of course we will use all of them, but yes, the, the question is not which one of them are useful. Most of them are useful. All of them, I would say useful. The question is which one of them can change the face of medicine, the change of, uh, bring a revolution in diagnosis. So that's, the, or treatment planning. So that's the problem. When we talk about learning in theory, uh, I, have, I have immensely, of course, uh, uh, simplified things. Supervised, unsupervised, self-supervised learning are quite separate. So in theory, they are separate domains for themselves. But at the moment, the reality is that everything is a subset of supervised learning because for unsupervised and self-supervised, most of the time you need good features. And who can do good features? Supervised techniques. Techniques that have learned a specific task, and then we use them as representation. We extract some embeddings. We do our clustering. We do our autoencoding, whatever that is. Autoencoding an image most of the time in pathology is useless. You have to, you can autoencode embeddings. Yes, that's useful because it's a lot of information already salient information in those things. So that's a problem right now that everything is. A, uh, a subset of supervised learning. So unsupervised learning for itself actually doesn't exist because as soon as I go back to traditional non-deep feature, my system collapses. So I have to use deep features and deep features have been learned by supervised techniques. So what is the main problem? So what is the main issue in medical imaging? So what can we do that really brings a huge revolution like adoption of microscopy or emergence of internet? What can we do? Well, the main problem in medical imaging in diagnosis is the so-called observable variability, is the disagreement among the doctors. If you take some images and show it to their different pathologists, the agreement be between the pathologists in this study was anywhere between 77 to 94%. So the kappa is 48 to 88. So there are cases that they don't agree. Of course, there are cases that they don't agree. But if I look under the microscope in the microcosmos of the uh, pathology and histology, what is the pro problem that the uh, experts cannot agree? Well, it's not, it's not an easy thing to see. So the, uh, and most of the time you don't have one problem. You say somebody has been diagnosed with adenocarcinoma. Well, that's a primary diagnosis. You may have other stuff in the tissue and they were not dominant, they were not as bad. So what we said, okay, what's the worst case that I see is adenocarcinoma. So I, I, I diagnose it as adenocarcinoma. Very, very difficult thing to do, but it gets really scary the observable variability that different pathologists, doctors, radiologists cannot agree with each other. It gets more scary when we look at the same pathologist. So if you give the same patient to the same pathologist and you get the diagnosis and you wait for two weeks and you give the same patient to the same pathologist, you may get a different diagnosis. That's the intro observable variability. That's even more scary. The agreement of the pathologist with himself or herself is rather moderate for difficult cases. What does that mean? That means we don't have consistency. So if AI is about to help us in any way, if AI has any claim, this is it. So this is it. AI has to help us to remove the observable variability, which is a cute name for error. And it has also some diplomacy behind it. We don't want to say error. It opens up legal ramifications and things like that. So we call it observable variability. And justifiably so, because again, diagnostic histology and pathology is a really, really difficult thing to do. So we, if, if, if I want to be super ambitious, I say I want to use AI to eliminate or at least reduce observable variability in diagnostic medicine. 
This is the biggest thing we can do. There is no way you can do anything more impactful than this, which is be more consistent than human beings and be accurate as, as human beings when they are right. Okay, how can AI help? Well, there are many different things we can do. Uh, when we look at the histopathology image, we can classify it. That we are really good at it. We can say yes and no, yes cancer, no cancer. We can grade it, we can stage it. Yeah, as long as you give me label data, anybody can do it. The networks are available. You don't even need, uh, nowadays you don't even need to design a network. You just go with one of the established architectures that people have used. You can detect something, you can segment something, uh, and you can maybe search and match for things that you don't know. So most things that we do, and I have excluded the uh, image synthesis to uh, generative models here. Most things that we do are supervised uh, in nature. Of course, if you want to develop segmentation or detection, you need some samples to teach the network what, what is to be done. Search is fundamentally unsupervised. You match it, that, that's unsupervised. But we use, again, deep features, and they come from supervision. So that's a, that's a problem right now. But fundamentally, yes, we have supervised and unsupervised. Unsupervised for me is search, clustering, grouping, visualization, matching, all that is unsupervised. So if we look at histopathology cases that I feed an image into some sort of network and then a diagnosis come out that says that's prostatic adenocarcinoma, that's great. But that's relatively useless. And I would say to just make everybody upset, that's completely useless if you tell me what class it belongs to. Because the question is, okay, how do you come to this decision? What, what do you, why do you think this is cancer? Because somebody has to write that report, the pathology report, and somebody has to communicate with oncologists and other experts if you're talking about cancer. And just saying it is adenocarcinoma, it, it's not very helpful. And I, I, I have lost friends over, over this discussion that I don't think classification in itself as an independent standalone AI technology can bring about any revolution in medical imaging, cannot alone. So we have to package classification in a different way. So if I look at matching, unsupervised matching and search. So if you have a large archive of medical images, they don't need to be labeled but they just need to be verified and we know the diagnosis. And you send a query and say, what is this? I don't know what that is. And then you search and match in that large archive and you send back the similar cases that you find. And you also find metadata associated with those images that you find. Metadata is diagnostic reports, treatment plans, outcomes, genetic information, patient demographic, anything and you visualize it and show it. That's a very different technology. So in, in contrast to the classification that just gives you a decision, it gives you a bunch of data. Of course, somebody has to look at this. If I give you the top three similar cases with all the metadata, somebody has to sit down and look at this. That's not very attractive. That's one of the challenges of unsupervised techniques. Why, why is search and unsupervised techniques so important. Well, we are doing that already in pathology consultation. People look at, pathologists take a look at the same difficult case and basically search together to find the right answer. They use atlases. They use WHO atlases and go, I have seen pathologists looking through the microscope, not knowing what that is. And they grab the book, if they say it's breast tumors or digestive system tumors. And then they just go through the book and try to find manually in a book, in a printed book, they try to find similar tissue samples to get some diagnostic clues. We are already doing it, but we are doing it with Stone Age technology, if I exaggerate a little bit. So computers can do that. Computers do the matching and searching and categorization and clustering. So why is that good? Because you can come up with something that I call virtual peer review. So if you give a whole slide image, that tissue, that digitized whole slide image, if you give it to an image search engine and that image search engine is good enough to go in a large archive and find, let's say the three most similar cases and bring them back together with the information because the images alone, they are useless. If you show me an image and say, this is similar to this, I will tell you now, I see it. So what's your point? 
What the point is that the ones that I'm bringing back to you, they are evidently diagnosed, they are treated, we know the outcome, we know the patient survived or not. So that's evidence. When we talk about evidence-based medicine, that's evidence and AI will help us to find the evidence, to not make the same mistake again and again. So the Curry image is coming from one pathologist and the images that we find are being processed by other pathologists. That's why we call it virtual peer review. So your colleagues are not there to consult them, but their information is in the archive. So we go in and match and say, well, your colleague had a case like this and he or she did that. So, which means if I have a Cori whole slide image and new biopsy sample that I, I'm not sure about it and I don't know what that is, and I find similar cases with corresponding metadata, basically I can put them together and come up with a computational consensus. Wow, this is, this is a pro probably an initial bridge to attack that major problem of observer variability. People cannot agree, so you need a consensus. How do you do a consensus? Well, bring 10 people in a room, they discuss to get a consensus. Well, we cannot afford that. We, no healthcare system in the world can afford to bring 10 expert pathologists in a room to discuss one case. That would be ideal, that would be perfect, but we can't but we can do it computational. So we can do virtual peer review, virtual consultation. So, okay, now I wanna, I wanna upset some of you by saying, is classification useless? I don't know, maybe, because when we classify, is a yes or no, or you give me a grade, or you give me a likelihood. Okay, what does that mean in medical imaging? It means that many doctors have to accept what the machine says. Very simple. All of them have to accept what they are saying. Do you think they would do it? I don't think so. That's my experience. They won't do it. They won't accept it because interpretation, explainability, reliability, uh, liability, and all those things. And to a certain extent, like us, computer scientists, also for physicians, ego. Well, I know it. I'm the expert. You are telling me this is this. Who are you? So. Okay, but what happens if I search and I, instead of, instead of making classification and you're forcing the expert to accept what computer says, what about we search and we find the top N search results with some metadata? That means one pathologist has to accept what many other physicians are saying. So AI disappears. AI is actually doing the dirty work, but we don't see the AI anymore. AI goes in the background. And what we bring out is say, okay, this is not AI. Your colleagues, your esteemed, experienced expert colleagues are saying this for similar cases. What is the catch? The similarity has to be really reliable. The similarity matching, that's the only point. The semantic gap that we struggle with it in the computer vision for many decades, then deep embeddings come along. It seems we have closed it, but with, with some challenges still remain. But now let's get more upset. We have lack of generalization of deep networks in medical imaging. This is something that I'm really, really worried about as somebody who has invested some of his scientific career into AI. I'm really wor worried about it. Deep networks cannot generalize in, 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 uh, in medical domains. So we looked at the publicly available data set from NIH with 33,000 samples. So that's 16 terabyte of data, 33,000 uh, whole slide images. One of them can, one image that I just showed you, one whole slide image can contain the entire image net. Those 1 million cases we have for image net can fit into one whole slide image. So that's the magnitude of things we have in medical field. And it seems that deep networks are failing the Turing. So what does that mean? So that means what we did, we grabbed three hospitals and we, we got their data from NIH and we trained and validated and we got training accuracy of 92%. And then we tested with unseen data for the three hospitals and we got 87%. It's not a huge drop, so it's acceptable. I'm not overfitting, it's okay, it's good. Well, but then I externally validated with the data of another hospital and I dropped to 53%, lack of generalization. 
Is it, is it overfitting? I, I don't think that's overfitting alone. It's more than that. It's more serious than that. We did that with many other hospitals. We, we played with this. Okay, let, let's take this part of five hospital. Let's take that one. So the issue is that when we do external validation, we drop, which means what? Deep networks have not learned the histology, the complicated patterns in the histopathology image. So we look at those and say, okay, can I, if I look at those images, can I say the origin of the image? Can I say from which hospital is coming? If we can say it, that means the data is biased or not the data is biased, the network is not able to pick up salient clues Instead, it goes after irrelevant clues. So, and we were able with high accuracy looking at the image saying from which hospital it's coming. Oh, that's a huge problem. So by looking at the image, you can say from which hospital it's coming. That means there is some, you have learned some bias. So, and then maybe you are not really having 98% accuracy for classification. Maybe those irrelevant clues are showing you a, a not reliable shortcut to the decision making. So we looked at it and said, okay, is it, is it, for example, for one of the institutions that we looked at it? So is it due to their staining? If you look at the stain is the color. If I look at the color, could be that, that the color, color is in, in pathology is a chemical, is hematoxylene and eosine. Is specific chemicals that you add because tissue has no color. After the blood is gone, tissue has no color. You have to colorize it, stain it. Is it the color? Most likely not. Is it noise? Probably noise has something to do with it. If you look at the background image, there is a lot of noise. This is scanning, like any camera system, like any system with point spread function, you have some noise. Are we picking up noise? The moment that we let CNNs go with uh, with filters, you also let the door open to noise. You just grab a three by three window and assign some random numbers between zero and one uh, and apply it on any image, you get a response. That's a nonsensical filter. Is this because of over filtering that you're biased? So if you look at, at noise augmentation, so we magnified it just with some simple computer vision techniques. There is a lot of noise when we look at the background. We cannot more easily, that easily visualize the noise on the tissue because you, you get the correlation with, the, with the, the tissue sample. When you look at the background, you see how much noise you have. Is this noise guiding or misguiding the learning? Maybe, probably. We also look at the search. And what we found is that first of all, the search is less sensitive to bias compared to classification, but still also search is susceptible to noise and be getting biased. And most of the results that we were getting were from the ho same hospital. That was statistically not acceptable. So if you have 20 hospital and you look for the top five and most of the top five cases that you find are coming from the same hospital, you are biased. So you are not really searching and matching. So what is the main issue? This, 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 this is what the AI community has to think about it if we are serious about the medical field. External validation is a foreign word in AI community. That's the main problem. So if you look at the dog images from ImageNet, what do we do? We do train, validate, test. Train, validate, train, validate, train, validate, and then we test. So one domain, different instances. That's the, always the assumption. There is, there's, there's no difference. So the images are, the instances are different or we are assuming they are coming from the same domain. Doesn't matter the image is coming from Germany or coming from Japan. If you look at medical images of pathology, you do train, validate, train, validate tasks, and then you get 99%. Everybody's happy. And then we do external validation and then you drop. So external validation is another hospital that you have never seen, not another instance not taking the same hospital from Sunnybrook and then doing 10% for tests, you have never seen those images. No, 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 it's more serious than that. You have never seen images from a specific domain, hospital. When we do that with deep networks, they fail the test, they drop. That shows we, we have not learned anything. Well, that's very worrisome. If that stays, how can we, how can we say we can bring about any major change in medical domain? 
Why there are, there are somehow, we looked at, for example, multi magnification. If I grab information at different resolutions, isn't that, isn't that what CNN does? Not really. So, because we are talking about physical magnification and it, it helps a little bit. It helps a little bit, like the doctor that goes to different levels of magnification. Can we look at few shot learning? Well, definitely, yeah, it helps too. If you if look at, for example, similar tissue and distant tissue in terms of texture similarity, that could help as well. And we have done some work, but these are, these are all just small remedies. They don't solve the problem. What is the fundamental issue with deep learning from my perspective? Uh, no, I'm going to say it's not something controversial. So, okay, so we have the human brain with the 10 to 12 synapses, 10 to 14 connections for adult human beings, and then you have something like a fishing net, you have what, 460 million compared to 10 to 12 synapses. Forget about the connections, so that's 0.005% of human brain. It's a small, tiny circuit that does one thing. Okay. But the problem is that Occam's razor, I'm going back to the basics for all of us, actually prefers simple solutions. And we know that. You look at any paper, we go after finding the smallest net deep network that can solve the problem. We know that. As a community, we know that. But the other side is quite enticing. You go deep, 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 you can solve any problem. And you cannot even then show that that very deep problem is actually a, a, a very highly complex nonlinear soft lookup table at the end of the day, if you make it deeper than it, it should be. Are we, are we violating Occam's razor in some way? Well, it seems so, it seems so. I don't still know how we are violating it. I have some clues, but I'm not sure. But I see the result that we cannot generalize. Well, we are entering the era of implementation. So do we have the right data? I, I don't mean the, the usual stuff of volume, variety, velocity, and things like that. Do, are we have, do we have bias and outlier and noise? How are networks are dealing with that? There are a lot of works being done in this domain. Is our data representative? There is no such a thing in medical field that represent. You cannot get images from all hospitals across the planet. You cannot do that. So the concept of external validation will always be there. And is your data stationary or the solution moves? If the solution moves, if the problem is non-stationary, then deep networks will, be, will become useless for a specific domain. Because then you learn something, you are assuming that your solution is here, I learn it, and then it moves. Then you have to think back about active learning, reinforcement learning, things like that, that can adjust with certain level of probability. Are we on the right path? Well, supervised learning is easy, uh, easy validation, high performance and accuracy is very, very attractive. Absolute majority of papers published are supervised learning. And we are using, everybody is benefiting from that. But unsupervised learning is, it has a challenging design, is a cumbersome validation, lower performance, if measurable at all. So it's not really attractive to go unsupervised. But we know that future must be unsupervised. <laughs> if you wanna, if you really wanna go to, toward the strong AI, the, the, we have to go toward more unsupervision or self-supervision, if you like. So we, we need to seriously think about that. So what are, what are potential solutions? Uh, we need diverse and well-curated data set and the well-curated benchmark data set. But most importantly, we have to retrain ourselves in computer science and AI community that we need to do external validation. External validation, and maybe we have to do it in a different way. So what are potential solutions? Multimodal learning, domain generalization, local global attention, active learning. We have to sit down and rethink the loss functions that we are using to address this issue. I'm very optimistic. I'm worried, but I'm optimistic that we still have a huge repository of technology created in the past 10, 15 years. We just need to adjust it to the, a very sensitive field like medical domain. And we have to more rely on search, matching, and grouping as, as, as major pillars of unsupervision. So the AI we have learns a specific task given a large training data set. The AI we need 
We need algorithm with human level intelligence, multitasking, let's dream, consciousness, ethical cognition, all of that. Everybody wants to get there. We still are doing feed forward. Doesn't matter you have skip connections, doesn't matter what we do, doesn't matter transform or not, we still have the feed forward uh, architecture in our mind. It's still for Neumann architecture in computers. We need to go toward, can we go Boltzmann? Wow, we still, we still are bene all of us are benefiting from the restricted Boltzmann machines. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't be able to, re to train deep networks. Well, we need another Jeff Hinton to come up with unrestricted Boltzmann machine. Can we do that? Well, that's good for, I, I, I think in my, in my time, we will not make it as long as I'm active, maybe after I retire, hopefully. Um, but this is where we need to go as a community to be able to really address those type of issues. So everything that we do at the, at the Kimio Lab has been uh, um, supported by Ontario government, many other institutions, Vector Institute are uh, supporting us, several hospitals, Dell EMC, um, MyTax, and so Thank to all supporters and partners. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I hope this has been somewhat useful and uh, hopefully there are questions that we can discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid. Uh, now is the time we've all gotten riled up. You told us, you know, classifiers have no future and, and deep <laughs> nuts don't generalize and they don't conform to Occam's razor and all these things. So hopefully people are sufficiently riled up to ask some questions uh, and pose some challenges. So the floor is open. Anybody uh, hand, you can use your virtual hand. Uh, you can also use the chat and we can call on you as well. Well, I have some questions so I can get it started because people might be shy. So uh, I noticed that in your uh, your potential solutions, a part of your presentation and something I thought about earlier on the presentation, when you're talking about the sheer size of images is something like attention, uh, obviously to attend to parts of the image and, and obviously um, architectures that leverage different types of attention, including self-attention, namely transformers and their variants have become very popular in NLP and, and vision. And so one question is amongst you and your, your students, do you feel that there is a future for these sorts of transformer models in these, these massive domains, or is this just the scale of these gigapixel images just way too big compared to um, the current architectures? Definitely, we are spending <clears throat> a lot of time and energy on transformer and attention-based uh, architectures. And I do see that they do not are not susceptible uh, to, um, at least in our experiments, as, uh, as uh, CNNs, uh, in, my, in my view, because CNNs mostly do over-filtering. Uh, they should not have that much freedom to apply to figure out uh, many, many filters. They may find filters that amplifies irrelevant data. Attention, it seems, doesn't have that susceptibility. Uh, so we are investing time and energy in transformation. Our challenges, because of the gigapixel nature of our images working with transformer, has magnified our computational need. <clears throat> so it makes it really difficult to do large scale test and validation and publish uh, reliable results. We have been hesitant to publish, so we, we are quite conservative, uh, at least have grown more conservative in the past one and a half, two years, as we had more and more uh, discussions with hospitals. Uh, so we try to do external validation for everything we do if the data is available. Uh, uh, Transformer-based techniques make everything more difficult. Uh, so we have to find solutions. We are combining it with some sort of dimensionality reduction, some sort of patch selection. Uh, so somebody has to select some of the patches before and then, but if I do that, how do I make sure that attention works properly? Challenges like that, but I'm more inclined uh, to go attention con compared to convolution. Okay, thank you. I mean, we had, we had scaled up attention to uh, videos as well as far as we got with these sort of sp sparse uh, spatiotemporal attention patterns, but I feel like sort of standard videos are still order of magnitude smaller than what you're you're dealing with so it's it's uh, it's certainly a challenge so i see that uh, nilanjan has a hand up 
uh, and uh, feel free to go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hamid, for the excellent talk. And it's very convincing for image search. Um, I, I have a, more of a uh, philosophical question, if you will. So um, you mentioned about this external validation. We know that for deep learning, it's a big issue at the moment. Um, now, humans, experts, do not seem to have that. But on the other hand, what they have is, as you mentioned, intra or inter observer variability, right? But could we hit sort of Godel's undecidability like thing that if you want to close that gap, we might actually end up um, having that inter observable uh, error by artificial intelligence? Again, it's, it's a really sort of philosophical thought. The solution right now we have, whenever we realize that's a difficult case, is uh, we request a second opinion uh, in the, across the entire medicine. In pathology, we, we, we request a second opinion. When, when somebody is in doubt, there is disagreement. Sometimes the patient requests a second opinion. And uh, we sent, really, we sent package the biopsy sample, send it somewhere else. Uh, was just looking at a, a, at a report from Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic does 50,000 second opinion requests per year. That's huge. So that's a huge part of what they do, expertise, a specific specialty expertise that you, you let somebody else take a look that you know he or she is more expert than I, and then I get a second opinion, and either I go with him, with him, with his opinion, or I go with mine. So we have to get rid of the observable variability. In order to get rid of observable variability computationally, you first have to capture it. You have to see it first. How you can see it if you have millions of cases. And since we just need the images and the diagnosis, I don't need any label. So I just need to know uh, the variability, the pleomorphic nature of the data, and we have evidence that it was this, it was that, and the outcome was this. If you have the variability of tissue and then corresponding evidently diagnosed uh, cases, then we have a chance to build consensus computationally. I don't think we can solve this problem with the, with the pathologist. Again, the established procedure is you send it, you send the package, it, send it to another hospital. Um, and that's cumbersome, it takes time. It has caused that we, now we have a recognized disease that is called biopsy stress. So people wait four to six, eight weeks, nine weeks, 10 weeks to hear whether they have cancer or not. That causes additional stress. So it's recognized that you have biopsy stress because it's difficult, nobody can say what it is. So you need multiple people to bring different expertise. AI and computer vision can bring that framework that we do that digitally. We don't need really to have the doctors physically available. But we, that, the challenge, yeah, you don't need labels, but you still need a huge archive of representative cases such that you can find the right match. If you don't find the right match, there is no consensus, also digital. Um, but there is no doubt that this is the single most significant challenge in diagnostic imaging. So that we have variability and that's the error. I'm not sure I answered the question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other hands or? Chat comments, questions? Okay, that's an okay. easy Friday. <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday. I mean, something that did pop into my head uh, thinking about the domain shift uh, problem specific to hospitals. So you said that one thing you, you, you could see is that when you um, performed your task on uh, a different hospital from which the models were trained, uh, whether that be classification or search, there was a decrease in, in performance. And But you knew also that you could predict the hospital from the features of those nets. And so this suggests that this approach 
uh, called um, uh, domain adversarial nets might work. Uh, this is the idea of training kind of a two-headed network to both predict the hospital and do the task like classification at the same time, but take the gradients from the hospital prediction and reverse them. So the features learn to be very bad at predicting the hospital, but good at performing the classification task. And this seems like the ideal setup for this, this approach. And I just wonder if anybody in your group had tried, I know you tried a few different things. I didn't see that on the list of the ones that you presented. Had, had you tried this idea of sort of trying to erase the, the hospital from the features? We are, we are experimenting with that. And that's a academically a very interesting question to, uh, to look at it. And we are looking at it also with respect to multimodal data and combined with attention. Uh, however, you have to keep in mind that in the reality of medical imaging, there is no way that we know all the domains. So which means what? We have some 50,000 hospitals across the planet. So we cannot train with all of them. We can take Sunnybrook and Toronto General and Mayo Clinic and Cleveland. So we have five, 10 major research hospitals who have the means to give us images and we train with them. But then an image comes from a small village in Congo or Nigeria. So you don't even know the domain. So I, I don't have the data to predict what is it and then somehow use the bias and noise and irrelevant visual clue to guide the learning and to just uh, defend myself against the noise and bias. So, and that's what, what external validation is about, that the fundamental statement is, look, we can never know all hospitals and clinics, never ever. There will be always a new one. And if we create that magical website that doctors can upload images and AI will match it with the largest global archive, there will be always hospitals and clinics that are not present in that archive. So what do we do there? So, and that's, that's in my mind, the largest challenge that I know available to, to the concept of generalization. This is really, really generalization that you, you learn the tissue, you learn the structure of the tissue in a way that doesn't matter which hospital. And when we say hospital, the hospitals are different for, for, for what? Because they have different imaging system. They have different demographics. They have different specialties. So they address different type of problems. And all that fl flows into the batch bias. It's not our batch. It's not the batch for the, for the learning. It's the glass light batch in the lab of the pathologist. That batch is biased. Well, I say bias. It has its own specific characteristics. And since we cannot possibly know representative patterns for all clinics and hospitals, it, it becomes really challenging. Hence, externally validating is the best way of saying how general your technique is. At the moment, we are struggling to get really uh, uh, less than 10% drop between usual tests that we do in AI and the external validation. It drops really considerably. And, and it, it, it's, and you look at the images, you don't see much difference and you don't understand why we are dropping that. But all those techniques that you mentioned, we are looking at them. And that's why, why I find my peace to go to sleep at night beside of the challenges because we have such magnificent repository of new ideas in the AI community. We just need to sit down and adjust it to the medical domain. Thank you. I see that Adnan has a question in the chat about uh, entrepreneurship, and this might be a great place uh, to, to wrap up. Do you, can you see the chat, Hamid? Uh, the chat, let me see. Yes, I can. Okay. okay. Okay, there are many healthcare AI startups coming up recently. Do you think AI is matured enough to solve such a crucial problem? What are your options as a computer scientist and entrepreneur? I see a lot, you know, uh, creating a startup with AI in medical field is the toughest thing, one of the toughest thing you can do. And this is, this is something that being innovative and young and smart is not enough. You need to bring the medical expert in. You have to have that connection. We have to work, and I just had a, 
uh, had an interview with Pathology News, we have to work with the doctors, with the physicians from the beginning, not, just, not sit down and design it for your company, for product, and then go talk to the doctors and to the physicians. We have to work with them from the beginning. So the medical competency and needs should guide any entrepreneurial and commercial guidance. And I see the trend that people think you can just go and create a medical company with AI and then do things. That doesn't work that way. It has never worked. Doesn't matter AI or not AI. So this is a very sensitive field and you need to be in there for a long haul. You cannot get it up and running in two, three years. So beside of your uh, innovation and knowledge and smartness in AI, we need really good connection to the hospitals. And from the beginning, you have to start with the need, what is really needed and what, what our physicians are struggling with. And then definitely is a very, very good time to create startups for AI and medical field. That's a really interesting perspective. So being smart and ambitious and innovative might work for you in many domains, but not in medical, me. not in medical. No. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Hamid. Thank you to everybody who joined us for the Friday talk. Uh, there's always talks on Friday, so look forward to seeing you at the, the next one. All the best. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Brown.